Okay, so we're live now. Um, I welcome all of you to the next session of the Future of Dentistry International Virtual Dental Conference. The topic for this session is Complete Health Dentistry and Oral Systemic Connection, Immunity and Oral Pathologies Linked with Other Diseases. Our esteemed speakers for this session are Dr. Omar Farooq. He is the Associate Professor, Associate Chief Medical Officer at the Penn State University College of Medicine, USA. And our next speaker is Dr. Akib Madasir, CEO of Next Level Dentistry and the Head of Department of Oral Hygiene and Safe Dentistry, Institute of Infection Prevention and Control. I welcome all of the both of these speakers and I will hand the session over to Dr. Omar now. Thank you, um, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I feel very honored and proud and happy to be able to speak with all of you um, for this conference. So, what we are talking about is oral and systemic health. So, there are some things that I have learned today. Maybe I, I can tell you a little bit about myself. My graduation from Pakistan, se hai, King Edward. Se. Aur uske baad, I have been in USA for residency and then fellowship in nephrology. So, I have been in nephrology ki practice kar hon, I do kidney transplant, immunology, or uh, uh, nephrology. In my other role, I also um, work in the healthcare system as associate chief medical officer, which is outpatient ke, uh, units. Ko, Unke operations ko or unke medical uh, issues ko jo hai, wo oversee karna. So, aaj maine badi maze ki cheeze learn ki. Some of the things I learned the new meaning of DDS, that how a dynamic, um, diverse, and dramatic strategist uh, should be there. I learned about some of the challenges which dental community is facing in the middle of COVID. And on top of that, I think I just few minutes ago I learned from Dr. Shafi about how. To, to manage, to scale, to grow the practice. I think this is my other, this is part of my other work as well, where I um, really, you know, uh, kind of oversee. I have, I'm responsible for 400,000 visits in the healthcare system. But I can tell you the things which we do at the larger scale are reflection from what is being done at the front line, at the at the unit level. So what Dr. Shafi just mentioned about dental practices, that was amazing. Um, and I, I learned certain things from, uh, from that. So my talk today is about oral and systemic health. Uh, just to go back a few, uh, couple of years ago when I met Dr. Mudassar, maybe last year, I should say, for the first time, I questioned him that Anytime I go and visit my dialysis centers, one of the units started giving, this was pre-COVID, uh, those mouthwashes to, to all the patients. Anybody who comes in, they have to take the mouthwash and then they go in. So he introduced me to this concept of the connection between oral and systemic health. So, so that's what I, we will, both of us, we will talk about since he is the expert um, uh, on the dental side of it. So I will, briefly cover about the systemic side and then ask him to jump in. Um, these are, let me try to move my slides. These are my disclosures and nothing is related to current presentation. These are some of the clinical trials I participate in, um, uh, but this is not related to the dental. Um, today, I plan to speak about some of the historic perspective of oral and systemic connection. What are the pathways? how dental world communicates with the systemic world and, and systemic condition, you know, uh, uh, paid back to the dental world. Some of the common things which we see in the, in the, on the medical floors um, and issues with uh, dental prophylaxis with antibiotics before cardiac and prosthetic joint procedures. So the, how, I mean, I think the, the concept of dental infection or oral infection leading to some systemic um, um, uh, downstream problems, it's not new, but it was not recognized very well. So there was a focal infection theory which was presented in last last um, century. And uh, Dr. Uh, Willoughby Dayton Miller, so he was, um, he published his world about the human mouth as a focus of infection. And really he, 
talked about the role of oral pathogens and their byproducts, both the pathogens themselves and their products, which lead to other systemic diseases, brain abscesses, pulmonary diseases, stomach problem, and some other infectious diseases. So Dr. William Hunter, if you look at his picture on the right side of the screen, he presented his work back in 1910. Um, the, the, his manuscript is available. Um, I, was taken, I was able to take like a, a screenshot. It's called oral sepsis and how, you know, the uh, oral sepsis is a cause of systemic disease. So, and he really championed the theory of focal infection, uh, but that was not very popular for in the like for many decades until we started seeing um, a lot of you know well-designed studies back in 1980s and 1990s. So uh, the the first one was you know by the colleagues in Helsinki. They they really talked about the association between dental health and acute myocardial infarction, and they they so produced the results that how there was increased risk of MIs with the worsened dental health. And then there was another study published by the folks and colleagues in Chapel Hill, and also in collaboration with colleagues in Boston, where they talked about the periodontal disease and cardiovascular disease and clearly showed, as you could see that, the, uh, the rising incidence. So as the bone loss increases, the cumulative incidence of this cardiovascular disease actually increased. So, so this was um, these were some of the well-designed trials, which led to U.S. Surgeon General, you know, report in 2000 when it talked about the interaction between oral disease and particularly periodontal disease and the heart disease, strokes, adverse pregnancy outcomes, diabetes, and pneumonia. And and really, they they talked about the term oral health and general health should not be interpreted as separate entities. They, this is a, a more like an integral process. So what are the different pathways where the, uh, the, the, there is a connection between, because you know, the mouth is, uh, is, is connected to um, uh, you know, rest of the body. So either there is a metastatic infection from oral cavity via transient bacteremia, which usually, you know, some of the conditions uh, and the most common and most dreadful is the subacute infective endocarditis, which I think we, we struggle a lot on our cardiovascular wards in the CT surgery. And especially, I think, as the, uh, the incidence and prevalence of patients having artificial valves is going up. So, so this has taken more an important role. There is a risk of myocarditis, brain abscess, you know, even cavernous sinus thrombosis, sinusitis, lung abscess, infection anywhere in deep tissues, bone as well as skin. So that's one. The other is what about the oral toxins? So they can also go somewhere, get metastatized, and and you know, trigger some uh, toxin-related. Uh, pathophysiology. And, and again, I think it has led to acute MI, the strokes, because uh, these things are pro-atherogenic pregnancy outcomes, fever, which is not going away, um, trigeminal neuralgias, toxic shock syndrome, and also systemic granulocyte cell defects and chronic meningitis. The third arm was really metastatic inflammation and causing immunological injury so you know you you triggered the immune system which really you know caused all these some of these uh, immunological diseases like inflammation uh, like uveitis ibd inflammatory bowel disease rheumatoid arthritis actually for rheumatoid arthritis there was a very nice pathophysiology and pathogenic mechanism that how the antibody bodies got citalized and if i you know when I was trying to look as like, you know, how, how it all started. So, you know, as the, the condition starts, the germs attack, that's in infection and body fights back, which is inflammation. So really it's the 
constant fight between the the germs and inflammation usually there is very nice biofilm but uh, and then there is very nice homeostasis i'm sure my dental colleagues are uh, well aware of this better than i am so but as the inflammation progresses from gingivitis to periodontitis you can see that the that biofilm you know it actually it changes and we just learned that how many millions of or or maybe higher bacteria that exist and as you could see that if that biofilm get, keeps getting infected that becomes the area of inflammation so it becomes dysbiotic uh, and then you start to see severe inflammation and the and the bone loss so as the inflammatory burden starts rising there is this cytokine storm that goes into the body and can cause some downstream problems so you can see that all of these pro-inflammatory cytokines can lead to systemic inflammation, can go in the liver and more, make more acute phase reactants and really affect the heart and bad pregnancy outcomes. Or there could be a direct systemic bacterial infection, which we just talked about it. Or these swallowed bacteria can go in the gut and alter the gut ability to handle the inflammation. So um, the these the some of these bacteria you know they are actually found inside these leukocytes inside the atherosclerotic lien inside the heart so so there has been some tissue evidence of how these bacteria and their products and their cytokines actually lead to bad outcomes in the systemic world there have been some studies done in the terms of reduced treatment of the periodontal conditions leading to actually improvement in the systemic biomarkers so some of the systemic condition that also increase the risk of oral infections childhood cancers you know we see issues in the chemotherapy immunosuppression graft versus host disease we, we struggle a lot with mucositis and gum bleeding hiv has its own issues diabetes both ways increase oral problem and oral problem lead to worsening of diabetes and this has been studies and, and and proven congenital heart disease patients have oral issues because of the chronic you know hypoxemia uh, and the downstream changes in the gum tissue sickle cell anemia has some issues as well so uh, chemo related oral toxicity is something i think we have seen a lot uh, in the cancer world mucositosis xerostomia and, and bleeding so risk factors are really you know if you start with a bad mouth you are more destined to have worse outcomes from 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 these things so it's best to have you know dental evaluation before the, you start chemo in those patients and we do that we send all of our bone marrow transplant patients who are the one who get the high level chemo to get their dental evaluation first how you can manage you can give them ice chips low level laser if somebody has is positive for hc hsv you give them the prophylaxis really the adequate dental care before starting chemo is much more important than once the problem starts because their platelets are low they keep bleeding it's very difficult to manage these conditions sometimes and you know really if their teeth are so bad you start with tooth extraction and i'm sure i send all of my patients to you so you are the experts uh, how to handle it the other couple of uh, you know slides i have i would really want to talk about the bacterial endocarditis uh, associated with the dental infections and really who are the patients at the highest risk i think if you if you looked at this study 10 15 20 years the list was larger but now it has changed so really anybody with the prostatic heart valve any mechanical bioprosthetic and no matter whether these are placed percutaneously or you know open heart surgery they need the dental prophylaxis so they need the prophylaxis uh, before any dental procedures anybody who has cardiac valve repair done you know rings cords prior history of infective and endocarditis unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease so those are your high risk patient who can get the infective endocarditis for dental procedures so they need to treat it be treated with the antibiotics for the procedures a repaired congenital heart disease and if there is there are still some shunt so anybody i think when they have congenital disease those are your high risk patients um and then valve regurgitation due to structurally abnormal valves in the transplanted heart so transplant patients i think this is a specific 
indication, but they are also at high risk of uh, infection. Um, the the what are the dental procedures? I'm sure Dr. Mudassar, he this is uh, his area, but really any time when there is manipulation of the gum tissue, uh, even in the routine dental cleaning. So anytime perforation of oral mucosa, tooth extraction, drainage, dental abscess, and things when you don't need prophylaxis is routine anesthetic injections, uh, taking the x-rays, um, if you are making some adjustments to the orthodontic appliances. So basically, if you're not going into the gum tissue, but again, this is the area of your expertise, and everybody needs, you know, ABCs of good dental care. And that starts with prevention, uh, which is actually better way to handle rather than, you know, active treatment. Antibiotics we use, uh, amoxicillin is good. If they cannot take amoxicillin, then, then you know, intravenous is ampicillin, cefazolin, ceftriaxone. If they are allergic to penicillin, then they can go to cephalosporin, which is cephalexin, clindamycin, and or they can take macrolides like azithromycin and clarithromycin. And if they are kind of allergic or un unable to take, then your option, you can always add a vancomycin dose as well. So the, the question asked is like, what about the orthopedic implants? Do I need antibiotic prophylaxis before the dental procedure? So I think the research has shown that patients who have orthopedic implants, and they, they should maintain good hygiene, but they are at low risk of increased hardware infection. So American Dental Association, in fact, that has gone to, against the recommendation of routine um, prophylaxis for these patients who are, especially if, if somebody is immunocompetent host. So, so those were some of the um, issues which I wanted to talk. And there has been some, like a known connection between chronic periodontitis with cardiovascular disease, which I've shown you, diabetes intervention trials have been done, but we need more data, adverse pregnancy outcomes, respiratory diseases, chronic kidney disease, rheumatoid arthritis, some of the pathways are known, even cognitive impairment. And I was surprised to see some of the pathways, um, obesity and metabolic syndrome, and there are some connection identified between cancer. But again, some of those studies have some effect modification and some confounding. So the data is evolving. I think we are at the stage when we need to have more studies done and better look into this connection because I'm a believer if you can prevent these conditions from going bad, you can prevent some of the downstream systemic diseases and the cost to society and cost to humanity from these diseases. And this is where I will end. And I will ask um, Dr. Mudassar in the end, you know, to address the dental side of it. This has been my journey. As I mentioned, I started in King Edward, went to UPMC in Pittsburgh, and then I have been at Penn State Health for the last 12 years. So I really want to thank you uh, for joining the conference and listening to me. I will over. I will ask uh, Aisha to take over and uh, uh, bring Dr. Mudassar in the communication. Aisha, are you able to? Dr. Mandasar, please unmute yourself. Okay. Sorry, sorry for delay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Omar. It was really an informative uh, session, and I think uh, you did a really great job with it. Uh, I just want to add a few things to the systemic part of it. Uh, there was a research uh, in America which we learned that 40% of the acute heart attacks, uh, acute heart attacks, they're contributing towards uh, coming from uh, actually oral infection. 
and uh, uh, we need to really emphasize a little more on the uh, concept of inflammatory burden. Total area of the uh, gums in the mouth is close to the palm of the hand. And if we have like inflammation and infection in such a big area, uh, that uh, the whole body resources in the mouth are being utilized to overcome that. And that creates a tipping point in information, uh, informative burden, and that takes us to a state where other organs of the body are being compromised, and that is why there is high risk for those patients to have a heart attack, stroke, uh, diabetes, pancreatic cancer, kidney issues, arthritis, even al Alzheimer's. And that is really the concept behind uh, oral infection contributing to, uh, towards the systemic diseases. This journey started in America with the, uh, 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 with, uh, like around 15 years back when there was a 10 years old in one third. And that really started this and done in America. I know there are people doing it all across. And uh, we uh, have now. Um, some a lot of people practicing bail do need method. And what it is 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 uh, even if they have history of heart attack or stroke, uh, they will eliminate all the possible information in the body. And uh, once they do that, if patients still have a preventive model of healthcare instead of reactive model of healthcare. So uh, what is complete health dentistry? Complete health dentistry is the state in the mouth where there is no infection or information. We actually accomplish a place where there's no bleeding or probing. And that really is the state we are looking for, which is a gold standard for dental care. Standard of care is like no bleeding or probing. And once we achieve that, we eliminate the possibility of any infection or any other diseases contributed from mouth. Our goal is that uh, we cre uh, create public awareness, we create awareness within our community itself because as a dental community, we need to really take this seriously and take initiative to understand what this is. This is a vast subject and this cannot be covered within like 45 minutes. And the purpose really is to kickstart that debate in Pakistan that we are looking at that, especially after COVID, because there is a strong link uh, between immunity, st uh, status of immunity in the body, and uh, 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 people who are exposed to, and also the severity of COVID. And, and uh, by eliminating the uh, possibility of uh, preventive measures, we can basically improve the quality of life and also improve the quality of immunity of the body to tackle the uh, issues like COVID. So when we talk about oral systemic connection, we have uh, covered the topic of like chronic inflammatory diseases like heart attack, stroke, diabetes, pancreatic cancer, and so on, other things. But there are also cancer regions which can really affect the whole body and also uh, myeloclea and missing teeth, improper restorations may contribute to TMD, migraines. Uh, they are people who actually have a compromised life uh, because of the migraines uh, originating from TMD and occlusion issues. Uh, and then also gastric issues. I just had a patient last week. Uh, they came to me two and a half years back, and I uh, advised them to get dentures and get some proper eclair. And the uh, uh, patient didn't want to get some of the teeth extracted, so he just didn't pay attention to it. And then they came uh, just last week back after two weeks in ICU, and the patient was admitted to hospital because he was throwing up. And then uh, they actually took out five kg of food from his stomach. He's an old patient, above 70. He's diabetic. He uh, just recently had a heart attack. So all that factors, and then obviously the body was not getting the proper nutrients. Uh, it created a life-threatening situation for that person. And that is kind of uh, what we are looking at. It is uh, something serious. It is happening. Even small things like you know, things we don't pay attention to, uh, like missing teeth, can cause such, uh, uh, such, uh, such a complicated situation for the patients. So when we talk about uh, causes of inflammation in mouth, there are different factors like periodontal 
skeletal factors and then there are dental factors. Within periodontal factors, there are things which are contributed by patients. People who don't believe in hygiene, they have uh, crowding, they have missing teeth, which create unhygienic areas. They, uh, they don't know the importance of all this. They don't go visit dentists to take care of their six months re uh, repairs and then uh, improper brushing techniques. And some people, uh, very few people actually floss in our Pakistan. And uh, this is something which uh, Dr. Omar Farooq was talking about, how periodontal disease can affect the overall body. And then there are factors within dentistry we have to really acknowledge. Uh, how about those patients who actually have visited a dentist and uh, they have uh, gotten an extraction done or an implant done or even a bridge, but we really never really taken time to educate them or even uh, treat their uh, periodontal status. We uh, don't pair your chart our patients. So if we don't pair your chart our patients, we don't know really the severity of the disease. Most of the patients uh, who get cleaning done, they just go through 15 to 20 minutes of hygiene appointment. And I don't think that is enough. It really takes an hour to treat somebody with gingivitis to go through the whole protocol. And uh, to do that, I mean, we have to diagnose properly. They have to repair your chart. We have to do a uh, proper scaling and it does take time, more than 15 minutes. Then we also need to uh, give them instructions how to brush and uh, uh, floss. And also we need to reassure the need for them to uh, come back in six months. So all that does take time when we are talking about ginger, uh, patients with gingivitis. Those patients who have periodontal disease, they actually need up to four hours of subgingival curettage, and it takes a lot of effort on dentists and also on patients' part to take care of that, to bring that patient to a state where there is no bleeding and probing. And that is the gold standard. Our ultimate goal with the hygiene protocols is to bring pocket depths for, uh, to one to three millimeter because that is the only time they can clean the teeth on their own. Uh, even if they are brushing, if the pocket depths are uh, deeper than uh, three millimeter, I don't think they can uh, keep it clean. So uh, the whole periodontal status really is something which needs more attention from us because we are the ones who are supposed to educate and create awareness in public and towards our patients. And once they come in, we need to take time and we need to take initiatives to really have recare systems in our practices to educate them and also take care of the uh, periodontal status. Then there are dental factors. Patients, uh, they don't visit dentists. They ignore their existing problems. They have cavities or periopic abscesses. They really don't have uh, attitude towards uh, oral health. And then there, uh, there are factors which are contributed by dentists. Those patients who have come in, they, uh, they were not diagnosed uh, with the periapical lesions which were present. We are uh, planning uh, implants or bridges, but we are ignoring cavities. Uh, we uh, do uh, endos, but then uh, if they are failing, they're not properly obturated. They are periapical lesions because of that. And then uh, there is a restorative work which has open margin or they have overhangs. It is not contoured properly. That leads to gingival information. Uh, if uh, caries was not removed properly, we don't really pay attention towards preventive measures. I mean, somebody who walks in and uh, they have, uh, they, uh, they need an extraction or an implant. We are doing that, but the next tooth has a small cavity, which could very much turn into a root canal later. And we totally ignore that. Uh, failure to establish cleanable services after restoration. And then also, uh, we just focus on chief looking plane and instead of looking at the whole mouth and figure out what, or what else is needed. I want you to take a moment and really think about it. Uh, we just talked about how 15 years old kid died because of an abscess in one third. And uh, uh, we know that, you know, some people ignore their oral health. They never really seek uh, help from dentistry. But then what about those who have come into our dental offices? What about those who have gotten treatments done? And uh, if we provide, uh, I mean, some of us provide work like this, there are apical uh, abscesses, there are overhangs. I mean, they, uh, this is, uh, I think, 27 years old guy who lives in Germany, sent uh, me this an X-ray from there, and he's coming to get this taken care of because uh, he has infection everywhere. Uh, this situation or something like this, some uh, patient got this uh, bridge work done and uh, this is what I found when I removed the bridge. So I want you to take a moment and I want you to really think about it. 
when we know there is a connection, when we are talking about it, when there is an evidence and there's a lot of work being done towards this thing, uh, we could very much be responsible for someone's heart attack, stroke, or even death if we continue something like that, some of us. And I think this is a moment we need to take pause and really think about what kind of impact our dental work or lack of dental work can do to somebody. So when we talk about implementation of complete health dentistry, how to incorporate, we need to start with believing in it. We need to really know what it is and what is at stake. And also, if we are uh, if we come with conviction, definitely we'll want to be healthy ourselves. We'll bring in our family and we'll uh, have them go through the retail protocols and all that. So it really needs a mind shift from being reactive to pro uh, preventive care. We need to have team because all that work which is needed to implement complete health dentistry is not possible by just one person. So you need to have an entire team working. They need to believe in the system. They need to believe in the importance of it. And they need to know what is at stake. And then you provide them tools and systems to help them facilitate that. Because I mean, I don't have time to have a sit down with the patient for an hour to educate them. So I have trained my staff to do that. We have to have really strong education systems for the patients. Once they realize what is at stake, they will be more than happy to get the treatment done. At, at, actually, we create a space where we don't have to sell dentistry. They would come and ask us what needs to be done to be healthy, especially our COVID. There is a lot of information going around and people are doing a lot of crazy st uh, stuff to even have stronger immunity. So we just have to really uh, Create that culture, we have to create that systems in place. And trust me, patient education itself is a science. There has been a lot of work done in America on this thing to a point what to say, what not to say, how to say it, when to say it. So there is a whole lot of uh, things we can adapt to make this process easy for us. Uh, con uh, consultation process. It cannot just be a couple of minutes a discussion with the patient to tell them that, you know, they need some treatment. We need to identify what really motivates them. We need to really uh, have them see what is at stake. We need to educate them. We need to empower them so they are in a better space to own their own treatment. We need to reach out to the uh, medical community. We need to uh, create awareness in public. And all that, we know that, you know, uh, uh, this is important. We, uh, we want to do it. We want to uh, make people healthy. But then if we don't have universal uh, cross-infection protocols implemented into our practices, if we uh, are going to expose patients to hepatitis or COVID while we claim that, you know, we are going to make you healthy, I don't think we can really uh, practice complete health dentistry. And there's a lot into uh, having uh, cross-infection protocols in office it's not just about getting up and uh, having sterilizers running throughout the day it, there is a lot behind the scene which we need to look into make sure there is absolutely no cross infection in our dental setups especially after covid uh, we have to treat every patient as if they are hiv hepatitis or covid positive and the second most critical uh, component towards that is center of care uh, we cannot implement complete health dentistry with kind of the work with, uh, which I just shared before, because that itself is going to compromise immunity, that itself is going to uh, cause more damage to the body. Uh, uh, so we are not talking about just reactive and we're not talking about short term uh, dental treatments. We're talking about long term dental treatments and send of care is something which can actually give comfort to patients because that gives confidence in the system, in the dentistry, where like, you know, people are comfortable getting dental work without a fear of losing teeth, without fear of uh, getting infected with hepatitis and other things. Think about uh, that person who uh, I just shared the slides, uh, pictures for, like, or even somebody who just had one endo done, and they uh, end up still losing the tooth after paying 70 or 80,000 rupees for root canal in crown after four to six years. It has happened to me. And that cannot be acceptable in this complete health model. 
Uh, and also it is hurting dentistry in a way that, you know, I mean, those people who pay 60, 70,000 to fix one tooth or maybe even more money and they end up losing a tooth, they lose faith in the system. Why would they want to take care of another tooth uh, once they have to go through the pain, they find time to keep coming back and then uh, they still end up losing teeth after paying such hefty amounts. So that is why standard of care is important. We need to go for complete examination, not just focus on the presenting complaint. We need to improve quality of restorative work, we need to establish marginal integrity, which is key to uh, complete dentistry, along with uh, no bleeding on probing. Uh, restoring a person and not be in a way that there were no TMD or migraines or GI issues. Uh, there are two components we really need to emphasize over here, that is the gingival health and then uh, marginal integrity in our restorative uh, dentistry, because if we don't have those, and they are in the interlinked too, if we don't accomplish No bleeding and probing. We're really not practicing completely towards our patients because when we are treating them, we are responsible for whatever we do. So we need to uh, develop pre-care systems. Unfortunately, most dentists here don't uh, take care of their hygiene in a way they should. Uh, I don't know how many of us really get our own cleaning done every six months. We uh, don't believe in it, so we don't bring our kids, we don't bring our uh, parents and family to go through this protocol. And that really needs to change because this is key to uh, the whole concept we are talking about because uh, uh, prevention is better than cure anyways. And once we have strong systems, we can create that awareness in public. It's not really their fault and no longer we can say that people are not aware or they are not educated. Onus is on us. We are the ones who, are, who need to step up and we are the ones who need to believe in it. We are the ones who need to create that awareness in the public. Unfortunately, we actually contribute towards the myth, uh, myths towards uh, uh, cleaning uh, like teeth. Uh, you can end up losing teeth or they will become mobile or they will become sensitive. So I think it's time that, you know, we really reset ourselves and there is a huge opportunity with uh, implementation of the retail system. So once we have uh, uh, ben uh, uh, complete health dentistry implemented into our systems, uh, we will have patients, we will have public who would want to get healthy. They will want to own their treatment. We don't have to sell it anymore. Our, uh, our treatment acceptance rate will increase. Uh, ideally, it's supposed to be 57%. We'll have improved quality, which will lead to uh, trust from the public and patient in us in dentistry and I think that can change a lot of things in a positive way for us, three care systems, uh, you are doing the procedures, you're charging for it and then you identify a lot of uh, uh, small cavities here and there and that's an added revenue for us. We reduce cost of healthcare. Uh, 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 like uh, we talked about COVID, uh, reduce incident of chronic systemic diseases, contribution towards making entire nation healthy. We uh, we have uh, this uh, situation where uh, there was a study done in America where they found out people who have uh, gone through uh, their periodontal uh, uh, therapies after they've been uh, diabetic or heart uh, patients and cardiovascular patients, there was a drastic decrease in the healthcare cost for each, for each of those diseases. And I think this really tells us a whole lot. So there is a win for all of us. Uh, you can directly increase your revenue with recare system only up to 17%. We can increase our revenue up to 50% with implementation of complete health dentistry. And I think people will look up to us as heroes, not just money takers. And uh, I think this is the way we can gain a lot of respect and uh, we can uh, be looked up as the heroes. So uh, we want to start this healthy Pakistan movement in Pakistan, and uh, this will take a lot of people working together. And I want to encourage each one of you to look into it. If you need any help, you can call us. We can really help uh, uh, get this started for you. And we would like that you know there are offices who are practicing complete health dentistry everywhere in Pakistan. Thank you so much. Next presentation. Only have five minutes. Hey, hey,
I, I, I thought my time was up. I do have some time and I want to share a story, really interesting story. Uh, when I was exposed to complete dentistry in 2013, that was after my pulmonary emboli. And when I uh, heard about it, I read about it, I, it really resonated. And uh, there was a story where there was 38 years old female who had heart attacks twice, and that was linked to one endolean. After uh, she got uh, root canal done, her CRP, uh, CRP levels dropped down, and thus she was not uh, at risk for heart disease after that. So she already had heart attack at age 38. Uh, so I reached out to a friend of mine who was in the same building uh, uh, like me. Uh, he was an uh, internal medicine doctor, and he told me that you know he really believes in it, uh, but he never really practiced it. So uh, it took me six months really to uh, keep going to him uh, every week. I would talk to him that, you know, this is something we need to work together. This is something is important and you need to really uh, 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 start practicing this thing in your practice because there is a two components towards in this. We need to practice as a dentist. We need to believe in it and also medical community needs to see the importance of it. So uh, one day he calls me after six months and he said that, you know, uh, Akib, you helped me save a life. Uh, I was covering a call for someone else uh, over the weekend and there was a 70 years old patient who was diabetic and he was uh, being treated for uh, generalized rash for 48 hours. They were giving him steroids, but uh, there was no improvement in his situation. So I just happened to look in his mouth because you've been talking about it so much that, you know, I thought maybe I should just look in there and see if there is anything and there was a thought with the abscess and uh, a poor guy was going through septicemia and uh, that was a life-threatening situation for him and uh, within 24 hours after IV antibiotics the patient started to get better and uh, that was the day I decided that you know I want to come to Pakistan because there were other people who are doing this in America but I think they, it is time that you know we start working on this because there is a really strong bank but like I said we need to believe in it we need to reach out we need to really raise our bar of work and that in turn means a win for us too because it will allow us to uh, produce more and I think there is a win-win for everyone in this thing. Thank you. Um,